Acts chapter 25 and verse 10. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For I, if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. For if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man shall deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. And after certain days King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is your brother, Hawa Yala. First of all, I want to give all praise and glory to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahweh Shai. Peace, mercy, and blessings be abound to the hopeful elect scattered throughout the four corners of the earth that are waiting on the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Yahweh Shai HaMashiach, and the ending of the age of Esau, which is uh, scheduled, according to the prophets, to come at the end of the world with the events such as Armageddon, the Mark of the Beast, and Jacob's Trouble wanted to go into this lesson concerning uh, this particular subject uh, that a lot of these uh, Edomite uh, so-called Christians or falsely so-called right uh, bring up and many of these uh, people that say that there is lights but clearly hate their own people they try and bring up examples uh, that are used many times in these churches to say that um, not only was Paul preaching to you know other nations but in addition to that you know, had a grip of believing upon him. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're actually going to go into this particular conversation, this particular situation uh, in which Paul was uh, basically appealing to go through for Caesar concerning his situation about him preaching Yahweh Shai. Um, and in part, if you understand the workings of the law and how if Paul stood before his own people, they would be able to charge him with blasphemy and therefore put him to death for believing on Yahweh Shai. And that's one of the things that he was able to do when he was Saul uh, as a Pharisee that used his authority to go and persecute the likes of, uh, you know, Stephen, uh, which was actually chronicled uh, in the book of Acts and other people. As you know, he was on the road to Damascus. Uh, when he was stopped by Yahweh Shai from going and persecuting other believers. Okay, so for the sake of truth, what we're going to do is we're going to look into this whole, you know, Paul and Agrippa situation, and we're going to really truly examine on, on what really happened and why is it that Paul understood uh, certain aspects of the conversation wouldn't even go further uh, with such a one as Agrippa. Okay, because someone like Paul, who would have been knowledgeable of the history of his people, okay, unlike you know, a lot of our people that are, you know, talking about this particular subject today that have not done research, understood, you know, who the people were that were so-called client kings ruling the land, okay, such as uh, Agrippa. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and just read further down just a little bit for the sake of the story. And then we're going to look into the background of uh, Agrippa and his sister as well, all right? So we're going to go ahead and go down verse 13. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, designed to have judgment against him. All right, to whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Okay, because just like in today's court system, if you have an accuser, they would bring them forth as witnesses all right, to testify. Okay, and that's the same system that we're under as of right now. Um, you know, many of these people that were around during that time, the chief priests and the elders had no problem uh, doing uh, false accusations and basically executing judgment um, under their own guise because they're trying to actually get rid of somebody. Okay, so Paul understanding all right, the state of our people and how they were willing to go that far would rather have appealed to the Romans court system and ways because they can only put him to death for things that they would deem 
um, worthy of death, which at the time, if you know anything about the about the state of the belief believers, as far as how many people were believers in Yahweh Shai, it was a very small group. It had not yet grown to the point of being a problem for the Romans at this time. So any particular group that would be deemed as non-zealous against the Romans and also basically superstitious in nature, it would be viewed at that particular time to not be a threat to the Romans. And this is the reason why he made his appeal to Romans, something that you could not do, you know, hundred a couple of hundred years later during the time of like the Diocletian persecution, okay, which which openly persecuted, you know, all people that were believers, okay? So as we go further on, verse 17, therefore when they had come were come hither, without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the men to be brought forth. Against whom, when the accuser stood up, they brought more none accusation of such as I suppose, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, and of one Yehoshai, okay, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, okay, so this is the Agrippa that we're going to deal with, okay, so I'm setting up, making sure that we get the proper context. Then Agrippa, okay, which again was the king, client king, okay, an Edomite, which even the likes of Vocab Malone and other even uh, Christian scholars will admit that he came from the line of Idumia through Antipater down through Herod and uh, Herod uh, Agrippa the first, which was his father. He's actually the second. OK, and we'll show you uh, that when we go into a little bit of his biography. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow when Agrippa was come and Bernice with great pomp, okay, because Bernice was his sister, we'll get into their relationship with great pomp, meaning she was extravagant in her entrance into the palace, into the place. So it says, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city. At Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man, about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought to not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, okay, nothing worthy of death, according to who? According to the Roman law, okay, because what the, what the, what the Jews that were in the land that were trying to kill him were going to use their own law, okay, to judge him as someone who was committing an act of blasphemy against the Most High by pushing Yahweh Shai, okay? And that's why he understood that he had, that it was better for him to go before the Roman courts in this particular case. Something that eventually you couldn't do, you know, under the time of uh, different emperors that were anti, that began, be, began to form into what is known as Antichrist, all right? Okay, and so, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, had uh, determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O Kring Agrippa, that after examination had I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. Okay, so now what we're going to do. Being that we're setting this up, we're just going to show as we go into the conversation, we need to first get the understanding for of who King Agrippa is and his background. So as we go here, and you can go to other sources, there's another source that um, you can also pull up the Britannica sources. Some of y'all even have uh, your own Bible dictionaries, but this is a simpler, easier way for me to just, you know, give you the information straight and then move on to the next points. So this is him. He lived from 27 AD, 27, 28 AD to 92 or 100 AD, okay, because he was actually the final uh, Herodian king, which we'll read that. It says, officially named Marcus Julius Agrippa, and sometimes shortened to Agrippa, he's also known as Herod Agrippa II, okay, was the eighth and last ruler of the Herodian dynasty, okay, which 
was an Edomite dynasty that usurped the authority of the Maccabee, Maccabean family uh, with the help of the Romans, okay, to take their, their position as rulers over the territory. He was the fifth member of the, this dynasty to bear the title of king, but he reigned over territories outside of Judea only as a Roman client. Agrippa was overthrown by his Jewish subjects in 66 AD and supported the Roman side in the first Jewish-Roman wars. Okay, and the reason why he supported the Romans is because he was an Edomite. Okay, which we'll probably try and get into some of the history about his con about their connection to the Romans. Okay, so they, they were overthrown by the Zealots essentially. He was overthrown in 66 AD. This is before the the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Okay, event, this particular some events eventually led up to these particular you know wars between the basically when you look at this when it says Jewish it merely means Israelites or Jews versus the Edomites. Okay, that's literally what it means. It was a what you would call a race war in today's uh, times. <laughs> now, as we go on, it shows that, um, it says here that Herod Agrippa II was the son of the first and better known Herod Agrippa, the brother of Ber Berenice, which is what we read when we're in Acts chapter 25, okay? Miriam Drusilla, okay, which Drusilla is actually brought up in the uh, book of Acts as well. Second wife of Roman uh, Procurator, pro, uh, procurator Antonius Felix, which that's is the Phoenix that we're also reading about in Acts 25. So Drusilla, who's also brought up, and Felix are both in the book of Acts. So I'm just I'm trying to do is show you that this is indeed the Agrippa that they're referring to in the scriptures. It says he was educated at the court of the Emperor Claudius, and at the time of his father's death, he was only 17 years old. Claudius therefore kept him at Rome, and sent Cuspi. Uh, Cuspius Fadus as a procurator of the Roman province of Judea. While at Rome, he voices support for the Jews to Claudius and against the Samaritans and the pure, uh, uh, procurator of Judea province. It says, uh, so I want to go to this part with Jo with the Josephus. So we're going to skip down because some of this stuff is not in pertaining to the situation such as the war. We'll just kind of skip down and uh, we're going to show this. It says here, relation with Josephus. Agrippa had a great intimacy with the historian Josephus having supplied him with information for history, antiquities of the Jews, which we'll, we'll get into. A lot of people um, also know that jo Josephus is considered one of the most one of the very popular non-biblical sources of that particular time in history of our people. Extremely good information that sometimes is even overlooked amongst us brethren, but there's so many little gems that you can find in there uh, concerning you know the history of our people during those particular times. And it says here that uh, Josephus preserved two of the letters he received from him. So we're, we're trying to go into this whole Josephus thing and you're going to see the reason why. Okay, because there's going to be information that's going to be revealed. Now I'm going to go back up on the rise to power. And it says here, we're going to just skip over to this sentence. It says, Herod Agrippa celebrated by marrying off his two sisters, Miriam and Drusilla, Flavius Josephus, the, this is the same Josephus, the Jewish historian, okay, meaning he was an actual Jew, repeats the gossip that Agrippa lived in an incestuous relationship with his sister Bernice, okay, and he knew him, so he actually confirmed. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead, and, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, because we're just going to basically show you what kind of person Agrippa was, and we'll see whether or not he ever changed from being this type of person or individual, okay, who's in an incestuous relationship with his sister, okay? Now, this is Bernice, again, daughter of Herod Agrippa I, which is the sister. She was about a year younger than Herod Agrippa II, okay, which was her brother. It says here she was a client queen, okay, 
of the Roman Empire during the second half of the first century. Bernice was a member of the Herodian dynasty that ruled the Roman province of Judea between 39 BCE and 92 BCE. She was a daughter of King Agrippa I and a sister of King Herod Agrippa II. All right. So as you go on, we're going to see what happens. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to go down to her relationship with her brother Agrippa II. At first, I think we're going to deal with, I believe, who she married. So, here it is. Josephus records three short-lived marriages in Bernice's life. The first, which took place sometime between 41 and 43 AD, to Marcus Julius Alexander, the brother of Tiberius Julius Alexander, and son of Alexander Al Alabarch of Alexandria. On his early death in 44 AD, which would have been, you know, she was married to her father's brother, Herod of Caucasus, which whom she had two sons, all right? So she had two sons, Bernice, Anus, and Hycranus. After her husband died in 48, she lived with her brother, Agrippa, which is Agrippa II, for several years, and then married uh, Philemon, second of Pontus, king of Cilicia, whom she subsequently deserted. According to Josephus, Bernice requested this marriage to be to dispel rumors that she and her brother were carrying on an incestuous relationship. Okay? Now, as you go on, it says, with Polemon being persuaded to this union mostly on the account of her wealth, so that's the reason why he married her, because she was wealthy. However, the marriage did not last, and she soon returned to the court of her brother. Josephus was not the only ancient writer to suggest in such a relationship relations between Bernice and Agrippa. Juvenal, in his sixth satire, outright claims that they were lovers. Whether this was based or based on truth remains unknown. Bernice indeed spent much of her life at the court of Agrippa and by all accounts shared almost equal power. Popular rumors may also have been fueled by the, the fact that Agrippa himself never married during his lifetime. So he never married, never had kids, but he was always around his sister, okay, who went through three fell marriages, and the last one, you know, basically tried to, uh, pers you know, influence the guy to marry him because she, she wanted to basically dispel the rumors. Because remember, these Edomites were before the masses projecting themselves as if they were believers, okay? But when you go even through the situation with um, John the Baptist and his death and what they were doing, these guys were swapping, these were guys, they're between brothers, they would swap each other's wives. These guys are basically sleeping with their sisters. This shows you the, the kind of people that you're really dealing with, okay, when you're dealing with these Edomites. And this is reason where, where, and there's a reason why I'm bringing up these particular things to show you the kind of individual that we're dealing with, okay, when it comes to King Agrippa the Second, okay, which was the one that was present when Paul gave his plea uh, concerning himself and his innocence of what the the Jews in Jerusalem were accusing him of. Now, I'm going to read this. Like her brother, Bernice was a client ruler of the parts of the Roman Empire that lie in the present day Israel. The Acts of the Apostles records that during this time, Paul the Apostle appeared before their court at Caesarea. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and go to the part of Josephus, okay, where this was, uh, well, this rumor, okay, alleged rumor became something that Josephus, Flavius Josephus, who knew Agrippa, confirmed. Okay. Now, we're going to go ahead and go here. This is right before chapter 8. Okay, so pretty much the last paragraph of chapter 7. It says, but as for Bernice, she lived a widow a long while after the death of Herod, king of Calchas, who was both her husband and her uncle. Okay? But when the support report went that she had criminal conversation with her brother now this word conversation is an old English way of saying behavior okay or conduct it doesn't mean she was talking a certain way 
It means that she had criminal, okay, meaning unlawful. She was committing unlawful acts with her brother, okay? That's essentially what that means. Agrippa, the junior, which means the second, she persuaded Ptolemy, which we just read, who was king of Cilicia, to be circumcised and to marry her, as supposing that by this means she would prove those cal uh, calumnies upon her to be false. So basically, she tried to create like a reverse beard, right? Just like you have rumors about these some of these entertainers that they're gay and what they do is they go and they get a what's called a beard. Okay, I'll give you an example. When I was growing up back in the, the late 90s, you had a guy by the name of Ricky Martin who was gay. There was rumors that he was gay and what he would do was he would go out on, uh, on these um, Hollywood nights with a girl that everybody thought was his girlfriend, but it was really his beard. Okay, and he would act all romantic with her like they're actually really together, but they really weren't. Okay, and a lot of these, some of these celebrities, they do the same thing because during that time, it was actually still a little bit taboo to be out there. Unlike now, it's pretty much a lot of stuff is out in the open and it's a lot more accepted, you know, here in Babylon. Okay, so that's what she was trying to do to put off this rumor. She tried to get this guy that was a king of another territory to basically marry her and be her, basically act as her her covering, so to speak, to give her a semblance of honor while she was still continuing her relation, her incestuous relationship with her brother. Okay, so now continuing on, it says, and Pauline was prevailed upon in that chiefly on account of her riches, yet did not this matrimony endure long. But Bernice left Pauline, and as was said, with impure intentions. So he forsook at once this matrimony and the Jewish religion, and at the same time, Miriam put away Archelaus uh, Arch and was married to Demetrius, the principal man among the Alexandrian Jews, both from his family and his wealth, and indeed, he was then their oligarch. So she named her son, whom she had by him, Agrippinus, and but of all these particulars we shall hereafter treat more exactly and there's a lot of information about the Herodian family or dynasty inside the Josephus but this is just to show you that those particular information that we saw in the Wikipedia can actually be proven in the Josephus okay now what we're going to do is going to go ahead and move on to Math, uh, Acts chapter 26 and verse 24 and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. And he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. But speak forth the words of truth in soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of the, these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? Because remember, they were forced under John Hycranus, the Edomites that were still in the land, were forced to convert over to, to the customs of our people as a way to, to try and politically prevent them from siding with the uh, uh, with with the Greeks and eventually the Romans which actually backfired mi miserably okay because a lot of these some of these men that were around in those times didn't truly understand what was happening as far as the destiny and uh, of the Romans and their and their rise and eventually the Romans used those same Edomites particularly out of the you got Antipater the Idumean and then a later Herod, of course, to uh, overthrow and usurp their position in the land. So this is the reason why that they, he could bring up this. Now, I'm, we're going to show you what this particular uh, thing is. Because, in fact, there's actually another, because this is actually one of the areas, I believe it's in the same, uh, same chapter. If you go to the book of Acts, in fact, we'll go into Acts 26. We'll start at verse 
three real quick we'll go back up there or two okay so it says I think myself happy King Agrippa because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews especially because I know thee to be an expert in all the customs and questions which are among the Jews wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently so just because he's an expert doesn't mean he's a doer of the law okay he didn't live that okay as we know we just read we just read specifically that he was involved in an incestuous relationship right, with his own sister okay so, so we're gonna see what that word for expert means it's noxtis okay which usually means knowledge all right so he, an expert a connoisseur okay that's all it is an expert a connoisseur meaning he had knowledge of it all right you have people out here that have knowledge of a lot of cultures and a lot of customs and religions you got actual people that are in religious studies and they have a very good understanding all right of the ways of of islam okay they have all they have the understanding of the different of the different customs they have the expenses experience of uh jihad sharia madrasas they know the difference between shiite and sunni they know about the different uh what's it called the changing right of particular you know uh doctrines or influence within the region they know about the expanse of islam from the middle east to uh the rest of the parts of the world north africa west africa east africa north africa you know the rest of the different parts of the middle east all the way to india to indonesia to the philippines these people have an understanding of these things but that doesn't mean that they actually are practicing those things that's the reason why paul understood that he could use agrippa's understanding and expertise of these things to use to appeal all right on his behalf okay because at the end of the day agrippa would have authority over about whether or not he would actually die and of course he is someone who would have authority over the chief priests and the elders of the land so paul is being wise in this okay so now what we're going to do we're going to go back down and we're going to go back to 25 but he said i'm not a i'm not mad most noble festus but speak forth the words of the truth and soberness and it says for the kings knoweth of these things before whom also i speak freely for i persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him okay the king meaning king agrippa for this thing was not done in a corner king agrippa believest thou the prophets okay don't we don't we do this all the time on the block okay let's keep it a buck how many times have we talked to people that people out there with the suspector edomites that call themselves christians some of these people have even went to seminary school some of these people have grown up in the so-called christian church they own the bible they read it with their families every sunday okay these people watch freaking documentaries they get the whole left behind series they uh watch uh the passion of the christ they watch ben hur they watch uh, the ten commandments they watch all these different movies and shows and documentaries and they go and buy all these christian books and and dictionaries you think that all these when you see all the christian uh books that are out there the christian history the maps you think that our people are the only ones buying them it, no edomites buy those things other nations buy those things and at this time you had actual edomites that were looking into these exact same uh things as well they were reading the prophets all right but the prophets and things was not for them okay and we're gonna we're gonna prove that as we move along so for, after Paul had preached all the things that he said, because uh, don't you can go through it and at the book of Acts 26 where he goes into his whole spiel about the history about how Yahweh Shai came to him and how he began to preach him uh, and uh, concerning the promise that were written in the, in the prophets. Okay, so I don't want to I didn't want to extend this lesson any further, but if you want to know more, read the whole Acts 26 to know the conversation. We're just going to go down straight to the nitty gritty for the sake of getting to the point. Verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. And that is the point that makes a lot of these Edomites out here say, Wow, Paul almost made him a Christian. That's the key word, almost. Meaning he can't even believe. 
he was impressed by the things that Paul was saying. But at the end of the day, Agrippa had no desire to follow Yahweh Shai. That's why he didn't do it. That's the reason why when you look at Agrippa II and you look at his history, there is nowhere that says that he was actually a Christian and began to go and fellowship with the brothers in the in the synagogues. You know, okay, that he was because guess what? If he actually became a believer, he was in Caesarea, he would go down to Jerusalem, he would have to be linking up with the likes of Peter, James, and John. There's no history and proof of that. And if you go through the rest of Agrippa's life, you will see that he was against the people of Israel. Okay? And how he turned on them. And how he allowed them to be persecuted and oppressed by Roman soldiers. This is just facts, baby. So that's something that a believer would not do. All right? So we know for a fact that he never became a believer, so there should be no hoopla with these people. But guess what? They continue on. In verse 29, this is what other people also use. And Paul said, I would to God that thou, not, oh, not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, okay, that would include Bernice, that would include Felix, and the other people that are in there, which some of, a lot of, some of those people were actual Edomites as well, were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice, and they sat, they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. They didn't say, This guy's talking about this Yahweh Shai, and we need to believe in him and get in and, and and follow this new savior. No. They went back straight to business. They talked to themselves and said he did nothing worthy of death or bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Okay, that's the end of it. Agrippa, Bernice, Fest, uh, Felix, Festus, they didn't, become, they didn't become believers. Okay, so this false notion of what is going on here we're going to deal with this verse 29, okay, where he says, A wood to God that only, not only thou, but all that hear this day were, all, were both almost altogether such as I am. When we go to the block, we actually understanding, see, if you're spiritual, you understand this. You understand what Paul was doing. He understood that they wouldn't believe because they're Edomites. When we go on the block and we preach, we could preach to a person that is very much well an Edomite or heathen. When we preach the gospel, when we preach Yahweh Shai, like Paul did, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, they don't got the faith to believe in Yahweh Shai. So you could preach those things and they can be like, this message sounds good, but they'll walk down the street because for one, they don't have the faith to believe in, in what we're talking about. It can sound good to them and they can even tell us, have a great day. It was nice talking to you guys. We've had that happen all the time. Go back to our videos. But we do this knowing that it's not going to happen. And Paul, appealing for himself, being wise and understanding, use a comment that used a last saying that shut the game down by him saying, I went to God that y'all would be as well as I am. But at the end of the day, they can't. And he understood that. And we're going to prove it as we go on in these other parts of uh, these examples. Now, we're going to show you where men have said that they wish that someone would get something and the most high said no this is how it's going to be okay now this is genesis chapter 17 verse 18 and abraham said unto god oh that ishmael might live before thee so here's a, a an example in which abraham appealed unto the most high and said i wish that ishmael might be live before thee meaning be the one that carries on this blessing now let's see what was said in verse 19 and God said Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed and thou shalt call his name Isaac and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him okay so the most high let Mo Abraham know that even though you appeal to me about Ishmael no it's going to be Isaac okay we've got another example this is Genesis chapter 25 verse 26 and after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare him. 
bear them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, and a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he had eaten of the venison, of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So here it is a situation where both of these boys grow, and as they begin to grow, Isaac took more of a liking to Esau. Right? But it was already told them beforehand that Jacob, the elder, shall serve the younger. So that meant that Jacob was going to be the one that got the blessing. Okay? But just because Isaac loved Esau doesn't mean that the Most High loves Esau or is he going to set him as uh, the, the instead as the one that's going to receive the blessing. Okay? So we're going to go further on to prove that Paul was very much aware, even though that Agrippa was an Edomite, he was very much aware that he had no place in the blessing. Okay? So we're going to go into Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye have, you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So we see here that in verse 16, Paul calls Esau a fornicator and a profane person. Now, based on the history that we've seen with Herod Agrippa and Bernice, they fall into that category. Okay, you see how profane and uh, much of a fornicator their families were, and there was no way that if they did not stop doing those things that they could be considered believers or Christians. So it completely nullifies the point whether y'all believe that Paul tried to preach to them. At the end of the day, you would have to prove that an Edomite believed in Yahweh Shai. And people bringing up the notion of King Agrippa to prove it shows that y'all have missed the mark and you're just grabbing for straws at this point. You're reaching, okay? You gotta stretch very long. You gotta do a yoga stretch to reach that far. All right, so we're going to go on to Romans chapter 9 and verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, or Yahweh forbid. Okay, so meaning that is the Lord, un, is the Most High unrighteous because he loved Jacob and hated Esau? Okay, is bringing up in Hebrews the fact that he was rejected, though he thought it carefully with tears, does that mean the Most High is unrighteous because he rejected Esau? Even though Esau was seeking after repentance, meaning he repented from rejecting his own birthright? Doesn't matter. In the same vein and fashion, you cannot sit here and try and change what the scriptures already wrote concerning his elect. Herod Agrippa, being an Edomite, had no part or inheritance or lot in the blessing that came through Jacob and the children of Israel. Therefore, Paul's conversation with Agrippa proves nada in regards to the argument that Edomites can be saved because all Paul did was be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove by using King Agrippa's knowledge and expertise concerning the scriptures and the prophets against him by basically bringing up his testimony and also telling him that he wished that he was like him except without chains. And that last part was like Johnny Cochran. If the glove doesn't fit, you must have quit. So hopefully this is edifying. And again, I want to give all praises and glory to Yahweh Ba'asham, Yahweh Shai, peace, mercy, and blessings to the hopeful elect scattered throughout the four corners of the earth that are waiting on the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Yahweh Shah Hamashiach. Shalom.